You are watching the second module of this course on critical learnings on forest and Adivasi rights. In this session, you will learn about the historical struggle for the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers, Recognition of Forest Rights Act 2006, commonly known as the Forest Rights Act or simply the FRA. To understand the overall conceptual premise of this act, it is important to learn about the struggle for the FRA by grassroots and other social movements. In previous lectures, we have learned about the forest policies during the colonial period and the Adivasi resistance to them. After India's independence, the government expanded the colonial policy of appropriating Adivasi lands and forested areas across the country. Through the decades of the 1960s to the 1980s, the Indian government selectively used laws which favoured an elitist model of environmental conservation and commercial exploitation of forests, an exclusionary model that absolutely disregarded tribal interests and rights. In protected areas, national parks, critical wildlife habitats, and tiger reserves, the forest department severely curtailed forest dwellers' basic right to access livelihood resources, such as minor forest produce, grazing land, and fuel wood. Adivasis bore the heaviest brunt of these measures and have fought long, hard battles to secure rights, ownership, and autonomy in the areas falling under the fifth schedule of the constitution. We have learnt about this in previous lectures. It is important to note that during this period, forest dwelling communities were marginalized and greatly harmed by the state's forest governance policies. For instance, the Forest Conservation Act, which lays down the procedure for the diversion of forest lands for non-forest or commercial uses, did not involve the forest dwelling communities or their representatives in the decision-making process. The Indian Forest Act, the Wildlife Protection Act and state forest laws have been used by the government to acquire forest land without seeking the consent of the affected tribal communities or settling their existing rights. On 18 September 1990, the MOEF issued a set of six circulars aiming to address long-standing demands of Adivasis in forest areas. These circulars were based on the ST Commissioner's recommendations to resolve disputes between the forest dwellers and the Revenue and Forest Departments. The MOEF circulars required the Revenue Departments at the state level to recognize pattas, leases or grants previously issued to forest dwellers. Moreover, the circular required conversion of forest villages into revenue villages for making the individual ownership of land possible. Apart from that, it required the recognition of pre-1980 occupation of land by the scheduled tribes in forest areas. The 1990 circulars are an important milestone leading up to the passage of the Forest Rights Act. However, over the following years, the state governments failed to comply with these orders in any meaningful way. Another shortcoming of the MOEF circulars is their reliance on colonial language in reference to the traditional forest dwellers. They were still viewed as encroachers in whom forest-related rights are not vested but are bestowed by the state through a process of regularization. The 1980s and 1990s also saw a number of social forestry schemes that were initiated by the central and state governments. These superficially involved forest dwelling communities in collaborations with the forest department for the protection of forests. However, these have not seen much success as they failed to make a real dent in the forest bureaucracy's top-down approach to decision-making. Nor did they displace the stigma attached to forest dwellers as encroachers on forest land. Another instance of state interference in forest conservation and governance 
is the Godavarman case, which has been ongoing in the Supreme Court since 1995. This is a case of continuing mandamus. Several orders passed by the Supreme Court in this case have empowered the Forest Department to expand its centralized control of Adivasi land and forests. The Forest Department and the MOEFCC have used these court orders to curb traditional forest dwellers' rights of access, use and conservation of forests, grazing land and village commons. Moreover, the MOEFCC and the Forest Department have dismissed community and individual land ownership by Adivasis by often misinterpreting the court's orders in the Godavarman case. On 23rd November 2001, the Supreme Court passed an order in the Godavarman case. In this order, the court stayed the regularization of quote-unquote encroachments. It was going to have a very severe impact on the traditional occupation of forest areas by Adivasis and forest dwellers. Then, the MOEF issued a circular dated 3rd May 2002 that all encroachments in forest areas be removed by the states and union territories within 9 months. This was done based on a willful misinterpretation of the 2001 Supreme Court order. The 2002 circulars impacted an estimated 1 crore tribals as it resulted in a spate of brutal evictions across India. Huts were destroyed, the crops of impoverished forest dwellers too were destroyed during a drought year. This mass eviction was the last straw for the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest-dwelling communities, also known as OTFPs. They came together to challenge injustice across the country. Over the next two years, grassroots movements, activists and researchers supported the tribal and OTFP communities' demand to ensure the recognition of their forest rights. As a result of sustained campaigning, an India-wide alliance, the Campaign for Survival and Dignity, or CSD, was formed. CSD organized mass protests, rallies, jansunwais, and conventions to draw public support and get grassroots demands heard by electoral parties, state assemblies, and the parliament. By 2004, the CSD's countrywide grassroots-led movement was lobbying the newly elected union government for a comprehensive law. This law would recognize forest dwellers' pre-existing rights over land and forest resources, such as MFP, and community and privately cultivated lands. They actively participated and deposed before the Joint Parliamentary Committee which was set up to examine the Draft Forest Rights Bill. Eventually, they were responsible for important changes which have had consequences till today, such as the inclusion of other traditional forest dwellers or OTFTs in the FRA. These protesting groups also pushed for the democratization of the right to protect, conserve and manage forest resources through Gram Sabhas. The law emerging from this mass movement is the Forest Rights Act, passed in 2006. The Forest Rights Act, or the FRA, provides a rights-based framework to recognize the traditional residents, livelihood needs and custodianship of the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers across the country. This was all about the history of the Forest Rights Act the mass movement, and the long struggle to enact the law. Let us now understand the conceptual premise of the Act. There are four aspects that make this an unprecedented legislation for democratic forest governance. Firstly, the preamble of the Act emphasizes the need to reverse a grave historical injustice committed by the colonial, 
and post-independence governments against the scheduled tribes and the OTFPs. These communities have been dispossessed in the name of quote-unquote national and commercial interests. The FRA acknowledges that these communities have pre-existing rights in the forest and that the FRA only vests these rights. It provides an exhaustive list of rights that are vested in these communities. The law vests the right to occupation of land and traditional livelihoods based on forest resources and customary conservation practices in these communities. Secondly, the FRA lays down a progressive mechanism for the recognition of claims to individual and community forest rights. The claims filed by individuals and the community undergo consideration at three levels, namely the Gram Sabha, the subdivisional level at the SDLC, and the district level at the DLC. Most importantly, the Gram Sabha lies at the core of the decision-making process. It forms the Forest Rights Committee to process the claim, adjudicate on the claim, and then the Gram Sabha passes a resolution to that effect, which is further scrutinized by the SDLC and the DLC. The process of claim making and the institutions involved do not have a hierarchical relationship, like in other laws. Thirdly, the historical marginalization and repeated dispossessions of the STs and the OTFTs through the forest settlement process have been factored in the FRA. The FRA makes a departure from established laws of evidence by allowing various forms of evidentiary material to be brought on record without prejudice against non-documentary evidences. It recognizes that many forest dwellers do not have access to government records and official documents to attest with their claim. The FRA thus allows gazette notifications, forest offense reports, physical evidence, and even oral testimonies from village elders to be submitted as proof of occupation. Finally, the fourth significant shift brought on by the FRA is its role in conservation. It democratizes forest governance which has been a key demand of Adivasi movements since the 1970s. The FRA vests the right to self-govern the forest, which includes protection, conservation, and regeneration of the forest by the forest-dwelling communities through Gram Sabhas. The law grants rights over common lands and usufruct, as well as it vests the power and responsibilities of environmental trusteeship in the Gram Sabha. The preamble of the Act states clearly that forest dwellers are integral to the very survival and sustainability of the forest ecosystems. Thus, it is necessary to equally involve their traditional institutions and customary practices for conservation. The preamble also emphasizes that the forest dwellers' livelihood and food security should be at the core of any development or conservation policies. Therefore, the Gram Sabhas must have decision-making power over what kind of development takes place in their forests. This step aligns with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, to which India is a signatory. Thus, the Act holds great potential to reduce the arbitrary power of the state in the forests while upholding its responsibility to ensure justice, autonomy and security of the STs and the OTFTs. The FRA is an important step in breaking down the stigma and criminalization of the Adivasis by preceding forest laws and state agencies. 
which resorted to excessive policing of Adivasis as so-called encroachers. This law has introduced a shift in the balance of power between forest dwellers and the forest bureaucracy. With this, we come to the end of our introduction to the Forest Rights Act. The next three lectures in this module engage with various provisions of the Act in detail. Thank you for watching.